One time, make me really look stupid. I was auditioning for the original production of Nine. <laughs> <laughs> so awful. I had done musicals, but I did not realize that when they said, uh, sing something in another language, that that was code for German leader, French art song, Italian aria. So I sang the Cucaracha. <laughs> Phyllis Somerville, a Screen Actors Guild Award Best Actress nominee, featured in 40-plus films, revered for her recurring roles and guest star turns in more than 30 TV programs, and star on the stages of New York, Broadway, and first-class regional theaters, was sharing with me that nine audition, which we joked as an audition horror story. Unfortunately, there's another audition horror story, one that doesn't elicit her rich laughter, one that was deeply painful for her personally and professionally, an incident involving other star actors, Somerville and me. Revealed here in this never-before-released recording, this 15-20 to 20 minute candid earful chat about actors, auditions, and the joys and absurdities of the entertainment industry. Snippets pulled from over two hours of recorded interviews with Somerville when Phyllis graciously agreed to participate as one of the working actors offering fellow actors career advice in my book, Acting, Make It Your Business. There's lots of Somerville in the first edition, but much of what you'll hear here never went to print because of page count limits. Though later on, You'll be among the first to hear a bit of what's to come from Somerville in the upcoming expanded and updated second edition of Acting Make It Your Business. But first, join Phyllis and me when we chatted at New York's Ripley Greer Studios as steam pipes banged in the background during a winter's afternoon. Words of wisdom for aspiring actors? Either be a really good business person or really have a fire in your belly. Why? Because it's not an easy business. What do you like most about the process and the business? Oh, the process. Oh, man. Yeah. It's so hard because sometimes I think I have very little process other than learning the words and then going in and, you know, you decide certain things you're going to do. But if you're really well prepared to be prepared enough that you're open to anything that happens around you. And it's that responding to what had that day. Anything about the business itself you like? I love the community. I think it's one of the best small towns in the world. Okay, you just shared that enough Bessie Hayden on the street, didn't you? She said, well, it's the same thing. And then she looked up at this building and said, there's all these people working up there. And Did she really? Yes. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Did she really? Yeah. Great minds to come up. Oh, my God. That's so sweet. It's oh. Easy. Having to type more, I can go everywhere. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh um, my God. Okay. Oh my God. What do you think most about the process and or business? Oh man. I don't like the fact that I'm actually more frightened now being out on stage than I was when I was a kid. I thought I could do anything. Why are you more frightened now? I don't know whether it's because I know all the things that can go wrong. I don't know whether it's... Maybe I know too much. Maybe you know too much? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Just I don't know. <laughs> You know, is that too, uh, okay. yeah, oh, okay. That makes perfect sense to yeah. me. What do you think is more important to an actor's training? Something like that, the MFA, or learning while you work, or taking classes while pursuing work? I can only talk personally. Yep. Because what works for one person doesn't work for the other. I think experience, I, I, I and this probably because I'm an old fart, uh, I like on the board stuff and stealing from people who know what they're doing. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I just, I mean, so, so that's not a put down because I, 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 there's a confidence they come out with and all that kind of stuff that I really respect, you know, a facility with accents and all those kind of things that is, that is there. But I really liked, uh, Learning on the, as I said, on the boards, my way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
I, I really believe in apprenticeships and journeymanships. I'm sorry, equity doesn't have the journeymanship anymore. In your view, what's important to an actor's training? Oh, man. To just keep doing it. Just to keep doing it, be it readings or whatever. To just keep, just, just keep at it. And the first, the first lesson we all learn in acting class, and this is going to sound, you know, it's such a cliche, but uh, to listen. I chuckle because <laughs> yeah. the original title of this book was Shut Up and Listen. Oh my God! Are you kidding? And oh my God! The publisher won't let me use. Oh it. my God! But you, so you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And I'm not not just talking about on on stage, which is the obvious thing, but just just listen. Everywhere you go, that could be the major talent if you just allow yourself to do it. Yeah, shut up and listen is is nice in a number of ways. Are there any things that an actor should discard that would hinder an actor that, that people teach? They think that's bullshit. Yeah, one of the things is a huge pause in between lines because they're going through trying to get their sense memory going. You know what I mean? Because, you know, they, they, rather than responding to the words, they're responding to themselves and then responding to the words. Does that make any sense? Yes, <laughs> okay. Jeez. So that could be a problem. God, there's so many ways to get there, you know? Uh, uh, what are, there must be some other annoying things. Oh, oh, people, and I don't know if this is about, this is about acting class, but people who, who do come in with, and I've heard them use this, the roadmap for the script, and I could turn cartwheels and show them my pink panties and it would not change the roadmap, you know. That always confuses me, because, I mean, you kind of think, did you see what I just did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Also, this was something, and this was funny. I won't even say the name of the studio. I had just broken my arm. So, uh, well, actually, it was John Pilmar. He asked me to do it a long, long time ago. He said, you want to assist me on this reading I'm doing, a play called Jazz, which I loved and never got on. So we were auditioning people, all from the same acting teacher. Every woman came in and said, would you mind if I took off my shoes? <laughs> I'd be more comfortable. So, I mean, there had to have been something in that acting class that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's not, that's just a tiny thing. But, I mean, I was, I was getting the giggles so hard after about 10 of those that I, I had to excuse myself for a while because it was not fair to the kids, you know. They were. Auditions, how do you view them? And I mean, as the experience itself, I and mean, what's, your, what's your audition experience for you? <laughs> this is so funny talking to you about it. The thing at, with, with Jim. No, I'm not talking about you being a casting. The thing with Jim was very uncomfortable for me. Um, I rather like them, for the most part. I, you know, there are exceptions to that, but basically, I, you know, I mean, it was the final call back and they said, be off book, and then it becomes about that rather than about doing it and all that kind of stuff. I can get nervous, or if you really, really want it, but basically, I, I like them. And actually, the better the job, the, or the, actually, the more they're going to pay you, the better treatment you get. Yes. <laughs> you know, just as a little yes. aside thing. Even as, you know what I'm talking about, yes. right? Yeah. I've experienced as an actor, and I've experienced as a director and a casting director, yes. And more and more, with uh, some of the regional theater things, some of the only times that I go in to audition, they don't do any kind of work with you. I mean, I haven't done it a lot recently, but I always kind of go, well, <laughs> you know, and what do you do? <laughs> I mean, I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so it feels like you just kind of stumbled into, you know, tripped, stubbed your toe or something. How's your approach to audition changed over the years? Have you noticed things differently from when you first were a kid to... Yeah. I try not to figure out what they want because I can't possibly know that. And I think I used to do that. I just... It's got to be my response to the to the material. What was it like for you when you used to try to figure it out? 
I just don't think I was as good. What do you do to prepare for a successful audition? Just go no, I'm not saying that, oh, I'm going to prepare yeah. for to do a bad audition. Yes. For a bad audition, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to when I plan to, plan to be really awful, what I do is... <laughs> Um, um, I just keep reading it over and over again. So when I go in, it, it's about responding then rather than okay. and being as familiar with it as possible. Have you noticed anything that seems to, that you do in an audition that seems to always work to give you a better audition or to give you an opportunity for a callback? I would have no idea because what works one time doesn't work the next. I will say that when you get that awful question, tell us about yourself, I always say, yeah, the funny thing happened on the corner of 8th Avenue and 36. You know, I was walking down the street and this woman came, you know. Do you make up something? Or is that just Sometimes I'll just think, you know, look at something that happened on the way because you know, something happens every block in New York. So I don't make up something. It's usually something that happened. It almost always is really what happened on the way. Sometimes it's not. But it's something that happened to me. And it certainly is a lot more interesting than the litany I went through about I was born in Iowa and I was a cheerleader. You know what I mean? It's just, that's, that's good. You like that? Because, <laughs> I mean, it tells you a little bit about yourself, but it's not, you know. And you're not coming up with the script. So no, I don't. I don't lie about it. But it's it's just you know I I do and just in case it comes up I'll I'll watch something that. Uh... You do a callback that often wins you the job. I think one of the mistakes. You're on the other side of the table, so I could be wrong about that. I think one of the mistakes that actors sometimes make at a callback is coming in and doing something different. I come in and do the same damn thing I did the first time. <laughs> Hopefully a little better. So, but unless they tell me, I just figure they want to see me again. They have me do the same thing. Um, how do you feel about rejection when you don't get the job? Oh, sometimes it just kills and never gets any better. Sometimes I'm okay, and sometimes it's just stab in the heart. You know. What do you do to deal with that? Call a friend. You know, read a book, go to a movie. The next segment reveals a true stab to Somerville's heart. I was a casting director for a high-profile, industry-gaga marathon of one-act plays that barely paid subway fare to the actors hired. An annual event laden with stars on stage and in the much-sought-after seats in the audience. One play focused on the relationship between two friends, a man and a woman of a certain age. For the female role, I was directed to pursue Frances Conroy of Six Feet Under and American Horror Story fame. Prior to the push for Conroy, and my not knowing the play's performance history, I submitted my customary idea list naming actors to be considered, after which I was informed that the male role didn't require casting. James Rephorn, a prolific screen and stage actor and star of Homeland, came cast with the play. He had done a reading of it. Wait, wait. There had been a reading of this new work? Who previously played the female role opposite of Rephorn? Any horror stories from auditions? Well, that one you were there for. If I hadn't been for Jim Rephorn, that was, I don't know, it was probably where I was, but that one really... Oh! Yes! I'd done the reading there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was all set up that Jim and I were going to do it. And then I got a call saying, you got to audition. And it was just, uh, I understand how they're set up there. But I'd worked there a lot before. I just thought it was all. And I had heard what was going on in the background. And I just thought it was a lack of respect. And maybe I hadn't earned it, but I just thought it was. And then when, and I came in thinking I was going to be all right. And then when I'm in that kind of situation, I can take pretty much anything but this. And Jim said, I know how hard it is. And I just started to cry. 
I, I do remember. <laughs> no, and, and, yes. I, 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 yeah. I can see yeah. you standing there. I remember yeah. the look in your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was not thrilled about the situation that the way it was happening. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a lot of shit went down mm -hmm. during that. And I don't know who was responsible for just... I don't know if it was... I don't know if it was someone else. I don't know if it was... Just said, stop, no, here, this is it, we do. Yeah. Because there was another thing about Sharon Glass coming in and having to read. She read for that role. Mm. In one of the small offices. Mm -hmm. She wasn't told she was going to be reading either. They had her read? They had her read. I I was told to set up a meeting. I thought, okay, she's coming in for a meeting. And all of a sudden, she takes her into a small little cubby. She's in the corner. And I are at the doorway. She can't get out. And then he goes, so you want to read? And then he looks at me, like, you going to read with her? Shit, my glass, don't do this to her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I heard. I mean, I was kind of, yeah, it was just, uh, I love that part. I don't feel that way about very many parts. I wanted to do with Jim, and I just love that part. That was just one of those amazing fits. I, I get it. I hate when actors do this, but I'll have to admit that every now and then you'll let something get to you, and I let that get to me. To me, I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it at all. I wish, I wish I had handled it better. But there was a happy ending to it, at least. Yeah. You oh, yeah. got to do it. I got to do it. And and Jim and I every night would sit there and say, "This is it. This is what it's about." We were very happy doing that show. That show. <laughs> very happy doing that show. Yeah, yeah. Just kept it as it is, you and Jim. Yeah. Phyllis and Jim were marvelous in the play. Together and separately, they were paradigms of professionalism. More than a decade after this interview, I rang up Phyllis, asking if she would be up for a new round of questions for the updated, expanded second edition of Acting Make It Your Business. Her response was an immediate yes. From our telephone chat, Here's a brief reveal of Phyllis's generous contributions to actors who will read the new edition. I'm going to ask a couple screen acting questions, and this is like a chicken or egg type of thing. Actors and talent agents and casting things that to get screen work, an actor must have prior screen work experience. It's oddly not the same thing when it applies to the stage. For actors wanting screen work, say they don't have a rep. Do you have any thoughts on, on what steps for them to take to help them begin and continue that journey? I took a lot of independent films. I needed to be comfortable in front of the camera. And I also needed to know the language of being on a set. How do you approach your work on screen? There'll be knee-jerk reactions where someone will say one word between difference between stage and scene acting, but I'm looking for your individual perspective on how you approach working with the camera. One of the things that I and this is just a sensation, is that you fill the space you're given. The camera's right in front of your face. I don't think the acting changed that much, but there is a there is an adjustment. How do you explain that sensation other than using the space you're given? I think too often people say, oh, you can't be that big or something. I never think about that. So much of it is, you know, you work on it and then it's instinct. Just about that instinct of knowing, of filling the space. You've had success with gaining a cornucopia of, of, of screen work. You really have, which is fantastic. Actors will sometimes have the coast dilemma. Do I stay in New York or do I go to L.A.? Have you ever had that dilemma? I have been advised, not recently, but I have been advised to go to the, the other coast, and I didn't. Why? I don't like to drive. Big thing in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now I'm not shy about that because I would say, oh, I can't tell. And to get very personal, I think uh, I had the idea that you had to be, that I wasn't pretty enough. And also, I, I even though it's changed a lot, uh, I happen to like New York. Do you feel an, an actor can get a good screen career while in New York with the opportunities that are happening here now? I think there are lots of opportunities. And that's changed. A lot. I'm perfectly happy being here and getting work. But so much of the work is, in, you know, where are you find? Where was this last one? I went to Massachusetts. Before that, I was living in Colorado Springs. So a lot of the work, you can kind of tell what people get in the tax incentives. 
you know, where he said, wow, there I am in New Mexico again. So do you feel like an actor could be 50 to 60, maybe even 100 miles from New York or L.A.? And with self-taping, I think they think they could still get a lot of work on screen. That's a good thing you brought up, that that means that you can live someplace else and still get work. I wrote an article on it, and I was surprised where actors are living, and they're getting both theater and screen work by just doing self-taping. My musical that I cast, a national tour of Million Dollar Quartet, was primarily all self-tape, and we cast the whole thing mostly from self-tape and online meetings. Theaters outside of New York, or even, I guess, some in New York, are casting completely from tape for a stage show. Yes. I can't quite wrap my brain around it, but I'm smart enough to know that that, that is the way it is right now. My work is act, and when something gets in the way of that, when doing the whole self-tape stuff, and it is part of the business, and especially now, the business of acting, I believe, is acting. That's a very good quote. <laughs> God, how I miss your laugh. <laughs> Every time I do that, the line is great say, Phyllis, would you stop? You just broke my eardrums. This whole conversation is left me blushing just a little bit. Phyllis, I Go thank ahead. you very much for this. You have actually brightened my day a lot. <laughs> I didn't tell it. Because one of the things my the friends my age and I talk about is, how did we get so grumpy? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't used to be this grumpy, but I don't know what that's about. I think it's just we're tired of the bullshit and just cut to the chase. I think maybe it is. Maybe because we have developed bullshit detectors through the years. Anyway, good to talk to you. Sorry for all those things I didn't have answers for, but it's just, as I said, you, you've you taught me more than you got from me. And I thank you for it. And when the puppy comes out, I will be sure that you get a copy of this edition so you can see what wonderful contributions you have made. All right. All right, Phil. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye-bye, dear. Bye-bye. That was the last time I spoke with Phyllis. She passed as a second edition of Acting Make It Your Business went to print. I'm deeply grateful that she volunteered to share decades of insight culled from her formidable career of screen and stage acting. I'm awed by her unflinching candor and openly sharing painful moments of vulnerability. Phyllis Somerville was first class. We're fortunate that part of her legacy as a highly regarded actress and her laughter that is generally human remains with us digitally recorded and on a printed page. Much of it not heard in these clips from our over two hours of conversation. In the expanded updated edition of Acting Make It Your Business, she and the actors from the first edition are joined by more first class industry peers. Selenius Levia, star of Orange is the New Black. Kelly O'Coin, star of The Americans and Billions. Actress and prolific playwright Kate Hamill, the genius behind the stage hit Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Vanity Fair, and many more written works employing actors and astounding audiences. The actors, talent agents, and talent managers who participated in acting Make It Your Business and its readers are in good company with the humor, insight, and generosity of Phyllis Somerville.